Okay, let's start a little early. Uh, I appreciate you joining this ca this class. I was planning on just recording this offline and uh, uploading into the Gamma Optimizer room, but I decided to do it live because I like to get questions and the questions could benefit the future audience. So the purpose of this class is actually to record it, but uh, we can we might as well take advantage of the fact that it's live. So the title of the of the class is is called the put call, put call parity and synthetics. It's a very interesting concept in options. Uh, puts and calls are related to each other, and thanks to that relationship, it's possible to create very advanced option trades that are called synthetic trades, and that's what we are going to cover today. Okay. So without further ado, let's start. At the end of the day, options are just ideas. You know, they are derivatives of chairs, which could be argued are more tangible. Chairs, you, we can actually, they seem to be real. You no, know? a company issues the share, they are recognized legally, the supply of chairs is limited, is, there are no infinite chairs of a company lying around. So, um, those seem to be more tangible. Options, on the other hand, are intangible. Options are just contracts. There is no supply restrictions or constraints for options. We can basically create options out of thin air. And we just do it. Anyone can do it. No? And uh, when we buy or sell options, the market maker on the other side of our transaction uh, is not holding anything. You know, it's very interesting because when you buy a call, well, we are holding a long call in our portfolio, but what is the market maker in the other end actually holding in his portfolio? No? This is something very interesting. You have to wonder, what is he holding? Well, he's holding a replicating portfolio for the call. And for those of you that attended the option prices classes, you know that how that replicating portfolio is structured. No? It is consists of a, a certain number of long chairs or bonds or whatever, but the, the idea is that they are replicating the call. So the call doesn't really exist. The option maker, the, the, the market maker, the option dealer is replicating it with instruments that actually exist. Okay. Well, otherwise it will be a chicken and egg problem. You're buying an option and uh, the market maker has to replicate it with an option. And when would you stop that circular reference? So at the end of the day, there is always a replicating portfolio. And that replicating portfolio that consists of tangible things or real things uh, is usually risk neutral. It means that the market maker is not taking risk on the position. He doesn't want to take risk. He's making money uh, from the bid ask spread on the transaction. He's making money from other things, but not because he's taking the opposite position that you're taking. Okay? So that gives you an interesting uh, hint that calls and puts are related. If I, if I buy a call from a market maker, he has to do a replicating portfolio that is risk neutral. In other words, if the stock changes price, his replicating portfolio is not changing at all. It's not making money. And the same thing when we buy puts from him, uh, he has a replicating portfolio that doesn't make money either. So in, in a sense, it looks like both portfolios are basically the same. Okay, and, uh, and because of calls and puts don't exist, the both portfolios consist of the same things. You know, maybe uh, in one he's long chairs and in the other one he's short chairs, but they are exactly the same thing. So uh, the, the reality of that hint is yes, uh, because we cannot have arbitrage opportunities between the replicating portfolio, portfolio of the call and the replicating portfolio of the put. There cannot be arbitrage. There could not be no difference and that creates the put call parity. And this is the way how cool put call parity is defined. It's this little equation right here. And if you have questions uh, at any time, I am going to introduce this, you can type them on the chat window and I will uh, answer the questions. Uh, this is going to be a slight delay in YouTube, but uh, it will, it's usually five to, to six seconds of delay. So please go ahead and type questions that you have. But the relationship is very simple. Look at this. C is the price of a call, and P is the price of a put. No? Th those are prices of calls and puts. Notice that they are not independent, because they are on both sides of the equations. That means if you know the price of a call, you can know the price of a put. What are the other terms of the equations? Well, 
the S that you see on the right is just the stock price, and the K that you see on the left side is the strike. So those things are all known. I mean, you're buying a call of, uh, let's say, a Tesla call of 500, and the put is a 500. There is a connection between those calls and puts, and um, the connection is through the stock price, the strike, and a parameter that is new. It might be new for some of you that is called the discount factor. What is the discount factor? A discount factor is just the reality of life. Uh, maybe uh, you have not thought about this, but if you remember <laughs> your economics class, you remember that money in the present is different than money in the future. And options are very interesting. Options, you are trading options now, but the payoff of the options will be in the future. So there has to be some kind of discount of that. There has to be a discount factor because 100 bucks right now, uh, today, are not the same thing that 100 bucks in three months. They are completely different. There is a cost of money or a cost of carry uh, with that, and that's the discount factor. It's a number, and the number could be anything, you know. Uh, usually, uh, if, uh, let's say, in a, an ideal world where there are no interest rates, there are no dividends, there is nothing, you know, money doesn't change uh, in time, then the discount factor is one, okay? This, so it's very simple, the equation becomes really simple. But the discount factor sometimes is higher than one, sometimes is lower than one, and we'll see uh, how it can happen. But this is the most important equation in put call parity. This is put call parity. Um, and why is it so important? It's important because it offers the, this interesting insight. The price of a call and a particular strike, K, is not independent of the price of the put. You cannot have prices going all over the place. I mean, the put and the call must obey this law with one caveat. The condition here is this law applies only to European style options, okay? And you will say, oh, come on, we are in the United States, there are no European style options. But I will say, yes, the most important options in the American market are European, and those are the index options. The S&P 500 options, SPX options are European, and put call parity holds for those options. And it holds, I mean, it's a law. Because if, if, it, this, if there is something different, if the prices of the calls and the prices of the puts don't respect this equality, there is an arbitrage opportunity to make money for free, without risk, okay? So let's look at this. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, for European options, put, put call parity is a law, it must hold all the time. Um, of course, in practice, there, are, there could be a small deviations from the law because the market is a real place and there is friction in the market, there are trades, commissions, there's microstructure in the market, Mar market makers sometimes don't want to make a market for you, so there will be a slight deviations, but most of the time, the law is respected. However, for American options, it doesn't hold, because American options can be exercised at any point in time. They, they, that that uh, ability, that, that extra feature of American options, um, converts pull call parity from a rule into a limit. So it's a, more like a boundary condition. Put call parity is the minimum price of the put versus the call, but the put could be priced higher or the call could be priced higher. But there is a, there is a limit there, you know, where it could not be deviated, okay? And in fact, in American options, in stock options, uh, the prices deviate tremendously. And one example of deviation from the law of put call parity is during dividends or when uh, someone is shorting the stock massively, when the stock is massively shorted and it becomes really hard to borrow, you will see uh, the put call parity breaking down. And that, of course, opens opportunities to trade. So, so it's something that I, I want you to be aware that uh, American options, uh, put call parity for American options doesn't hold all the time. There are moments where it doesn't hold. So, of course, you could take my word for it, but I, I want to do a real example. Let's look at this example. I, uh, this example was created yesterday uh, when I prepared this, this presentation. And I, we are looking at the options expire at the end of October and the 3,500 strike. You can see a call, you can see a put, and the strike is 3,500. And you can see the prices. You know, the prices are, are 
the mid price you remember that I in options we always use the mid price the bid and ask uh, is, uh, is the reference that we use to compute the mid and so so the call is around 30 bucks and the put is really expensive is a 158 because it was in the money yesterday now so we know when I created this when I quote this the stock market was at this level 3375 and the strike is 3500 so with that information I can compute the discount factor for October from the equation, no? The, this, from this equation, I can just, uh, I, I know pretty much everything and I don't know the discount factor. And we can see how close to one it comes. And if you do that, this is the equation for the discount factor. And if you replace all of the values, you obtain 1.0008. That's very close to one. And the, one of the reasons it's very close to one is because uh, October, the, the end of October is only 30 days ahead and uh, the discount factor tends to become one when time is really short. So if I had picked something expiring in 2022 or something expiring in you know, two years from now, three years from now, then we will see a, a meaningful discount factor different than one. But this gives, gives us an idea that, that your put call parity holds. It's very interesting because I did this, um, and uh, and also, well, the, one of the reasons it's almost close to one is because interest rates are zero, <laughs> basically, and there is only very little dividend yield from here to the end of the month, and that's what is one, you know, because interest uh, interest rates and dividends affect the discount factor. So here we can see this, and now let's look at another example. This example is at a different time. Notice that the, the market went up two points. Uh, and a different strike. These options are more, with the market at 3,377, these options are more at the money, like near the money, and the prices are more balanced. Notice that the prices of the calls and the puts are more balanced, 87.4, 87.9, um, and the strike is 3,375, and when I do that, I obtain the same discount factor. It's basically the same discount factor, because it has to be the same for the whole chain discount factor has to be because it only depends on time and you can see here uh, that put call parity really holds for uh, SPX options okay this is not something that is only in the books it actually happens in reality and I show you a case where options were really deep in the money and the other ones where they are near the money and it's basically the same thing it's exactly the same thing if you have any questions Folks, please don't hesitate to type them on the on the chat window, and I will reply them as a, as we go. Okay, so so far this is really cool. Yes, uh, put cool parity holes. I mean, yeah. Okay, how is this even important? How can I use this? Well, there are many uses for put cool parity, and um, and the one right off the bat, the most important use is to price deep in the money options. I, I got into big argument in the Gamma Optimizer room uh, about this. Uh, I didn't want to, but I mean, I got into this because uh, in reality, deep in the money options are terribly quote. The quotes for deep in the money options are usually bad. They could be bad, a little bit bad, or it could be massively bad, okay? And there are many reasons for that. One of the reasons is uh, market makers, people that actually make the markets in options, they don't want to, to deal in, in the money options. I mean, in the money options are very capital intensive. And so they don't want to deal on them. And they want, and, and also, because they are already in the money, no? so, so they will be harder to hedge, they will be capital intensive, it's a pain in the neck. So they don't want to. Uh, also, real life data shows that most of the trading happens near the money. So during the day, uh, most of the options traded will be really close to whatever the stock price is. Uh, so options that are really, really deep in the money, they don't trade. So, so what happens is, uh, because all of market makers have to provide the quotes for all these things uh, at any time, they really update really frequently the quotes for options that are near the money area. But then they update the in the money options like once every 10 minutes. I mean, it's not as frequent the update because there is no one trading, then no one wants to uh, really do anything on it. Unless you send a real order, then they start updating it, okay? So then th that means that when you access data, 
and when you want to do your own studies and research, you must assume that deep in the money option quotes are wrong. They are, they are not correct. That's what you must assume. And if, if any of you have done uh, this and you have tried to, co to compute implied volatility, you will notice that deep in the money options, the, the data is always noisy. So there is a way to solve this problem because we now put call parity. If an option, if a call option is deep in the money, then the put is out of the money. So the quote for the put will be really good and the quote for the call will be really bad. But we don't care because if we know the price of the other, we can know the price of the one we want, okay? And the technique is very simple. You, you find the discount factor uh, from the near the money options. And then we use put call parity to find the value of the, in the, uh, the, in the money option using the price of the option that is out of the money. For instance, right here. Yesterday, I quote uh, the 3,800 strike calls and puts. Notice that the 3,800 strike with the with the market at um, it was 3,379. You can tell that the market was changing as I was getting all these values. <laughs> Those were actually real values yesterday when I prepared the presentation. Notice that the calls are really out of the money. You know, 3,800. It's really out of the money. It's, it's like 420 points out of the money. And uh, notice that they are very cheap. They have a um, very tight bid ask spread. It's only a few cents, like six cents <laughs> between them. And it has a nice mid. But notice the put. The 3,800 puts are deep in the money. You know, they, they are like 420 bucks in the money. And, and because of that, notice the spread. The spread is really wide. You now the spread between the two is like five bucks between the bid and the ask is a gigantic spread. And the meat uh, is not that bad. The meat seems to be reasonable, but it's not quite the real meat. This option should be more expensive than it looks like, okay? It looks cheaper than meat price, but we could compute the real price of the put. And it's very simple. We are, are going to use the, a discount factor of 1.000824, which is the one we found a couple of slides ago, and it should be the same for all of the option chain at that particular time. And then we use K is a strike, 3,800, then the price of the stock, or in this case, the index. And then we do the formula. We just, you know, the formula for P, we can use algebra to, you know, solve for P, and this is the formula for P. And then with the price of the call, starting just with the price of the call, and using the discount factor we found before and all these things, it gave us a price of 525.80 cents, almost 88 cents. So that, notice that put call parity works. And look at the answer. The answer is very close. And clearly, you can see that the put is a little underpriced. And the reason it's a little underpriced is because this quote is not very uh, trustworthy. I mean, we should not trust this quote that much. So if you were holding this put, uh, a market maker was trying to take advantage of you uh, when you when you sold it. So, so then then uh, this is the right price that you can use as a reference to negotiate with market makers. Okay, I have a question. Cool. How often does the discount factor changes daily? Does calculation need to be recalculated periodically? That's a great question, David. It changes every second. The discount factor is a function of time. Okay. Um, but I mean, meaningfully notice that I have done all these things at different points in time and it changed very little. So uh, even though it changes every second, it changes like the, the, the decimal that we change will be long ago. So what you do is uh, you get the full option chain at the point you want to do it, compute the disc, you, you quote the near, uh, in the, near the money options, compute the discount factor for them and then quickly compute everything else you want to do. You know, I mean, within a few minutes. And, 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 and mathematically, the price will not change, at least not in the penny area. It might change here in the fourth decimal, fifth decimal, you know, something really far. So you can use it. Uh, uh, the discount factor changes every day, and it changes with the value of the market, too. And, uh, and we'll see why the discount factor is always changing. But as long as you do these computations really quickly, you can do it. I mean, you just do it. Uh, you just quote like all of the options right away and then compute this count factor from that quote and you do it in real time. Okay, so don't assume that if, if I do, uh, if today, if, if I were to repeat this experiment today, I will find a different discount factor. No, it will be a slightly different, probably it will be lower than yesterday. 
no? uh, because remember the discount factor converges to one you know in october the last day of october the last for <laughs> that whatever is that day october 30 near 4 pm the discount factor will be 1.0 exactly okay and we'll see why later on so that's one of the first uses of uh, put call parity to clean up data and this is very important this is more important than you think because uh, all of the data that we have the end of the day data is dirty for all of the in the money options okay and this is one way this is one technique that pretty much every academic and researcher uses they clean up the deep in the money options using put call parity they just use uh, a different one and of course changing the value changes imply volatility changes a lot of stuff uh, so as Steve says, can rely on the call price to be accurate in this example? Yes, Steve. In this example, uh, in, in general, we can always rely on the uh, out of the money option to compute the price. It could be different. I could have picked an example below the current, uh, like for instance, one thousand. In that case, the call will be deep in the money, and the put will be out of the money, and we could trust the the put quote. And and as I said before, the reason we can trust the, the out of the money uh, quote is because the software does it and uh, dealers love dealing in this type of options. They love. <laughs> those, are, those type of options are very easy to deal and, um, and they, they, they don't require any capital. They are so out of the money that, that they don't even have to hedge them that frequently. So this is something that they want to, and you can tell right here by the bid ask spread. You notice that it's only six cents. It's nothing, you know. It's, it's a very small uh, spread, and it's very liquid. Uh, while the put is tremendously liquid, they don't want you to to deal on the put. So, so yes, you use whatever is the more liquid to use put call parity. Okay. Well, so this is fun. This is this might come handy once in a blue moon where you were holding a position that suddenly be became deep in the money because the market I don't know crashed and now your puts are tremendously deep in the money and now if you want to figure out what is a good price that the, they will, the market will take yes then use that but however there are other examples that are much better okay and we are entering into the real meat of the of the presentation so um, by you, clever usage of put call parity, we can create synthetic positions. And let's start with a simple synthetic position. I'm going to just propose this. Let's sell, let's buy a call, a particular strike. I don't care what the strike is. Let's buy a call at strike K, okay? And at the same time, let's sell a put at the same strike. The same expiration, same strike, I just buy a call and sell a put. And this is kind of fun, like, hey, we do that, but what do we get? I mean, if we do that, what is what we are getting? Well, so if we look at the position in terms of options, yes, I, ha I am holding a long call and I'm holding a short put. Oh, but that doesn't give us any insight into what we are holding. However, because we know that the prices of the calls and the puts are connected and they have to obey put call parity, then we can figure out what the position is. And then, so I just leave the call. I could do it in any case. You know, I leave the call, and instead of writing the put, I write the pull call parity for the put. You know, I write the equation. This is the equation for the put. And you can see what you are holding. You can see that the call cancels each out, and the only thing that is uh, that the stock becomes positive, and then this is this factor. Notice this. The position that you are holding at the end of the day doesn't depend on the options at all. It really is not sensitive to the prices of the options. It doesn't care about the options. Uh, this is a constant, a discount factor times and a strike is just a, a value that will never change. Or well, the discount factor changes to one. I mean, it will change very little, but it doesn't depend on anything else. It only depends on time. And what we have is the stock. So by buying a call, uh, selling a put is conceptually the same thing that buying a chair. Is, this is what is called a synthetic long. By doing this really nice trick, we are actually going long and stuck. You see, it's a, it's a very interesting trick. And um, it's called a synthetic long and it tracks exactly. I mean, it's a perfect, you can tell right here by put call parity that is going to track exactly the stock. If the stock goes up $1 or position goes up $1. If the stock comes down $1, our position is going to come down too. 
So, so synthetic lungs are very, very useful. You will say, okay, come on, <laughs> I could just buy the chair. Why do I want a synthetic lung? And I say, fine, I understand the point. You know, they, they don't seem that practical to use. The only thing that I could think of is that notice depending on the strike, the position could be cheaper than buying the stock. Notice that there is minus this, you know? So, so the, the difference is that the position is, could be cheaper than the stock. That's the only difference, you know? That, that you will require less capital than buying the stock. Of course, all of that capital that you save will be used because you are shorting a put and you will be have margin on the short put. And at the end of the day, it's a, it's a headache. So doing a synthetic loan for the sake of doing a synthetic loan serves no purpose. However, just keep this on your mind because it will come handy later on. But so at least we know that we can do a synthetic loan. Of course, the question becomes, uh, can we do a synthetic short? What do you think, guys? Do you, do you think that we can do a synthetic short? And the answer is, yes, we can do one. Uh, and it's just the opposite of that. Let's look at a synthetic short. We just sell the call and buy the put. You know? So the position that we have is a put minus a call. But by doing the same put call parity magic that we did, we find that the position, again, doesn't depend on the options at all. And the only thing that it depends is on the negative of the stock, which means you are short the stock. So this is a synthetic short. We are short the stock by just selling the call and buying the put. And the synthetic short, on the other hand, is very, very handy. I mean, these things can open, <laughs> can open a gigantic amount of, um, of opportunities in terms of trade. The synthetic short is very helpful, okay? So, uh, when can any one of you think of an example where the synthetic chart could be really helpful? Uh, you will, will be, I am curious if any one of you can think about it. I'll let you think about it. Well, in what case, what happens if the stock is impossible to chart? Have, you have found that particular case. No? You, have you seen that sometimes uh, stocks become really hard to borrow and you go to your broker and they cannot locate shares for you to sell short? and you cannot enter in a short position, you would love to enter in a short position, but it is, the, it is not. Or maybe they are charging you outrageous interest on the chart. Well, a synthetic chart is a way to chart. If you cannot find shares, uh, yes, that's a really good step. Is, you know, if, if the borrowing costs are very high, the synthetic chart is the perfect way to do it. You just do it and, uh, and you're charting, and then you close your chart if, if, if your thesis is correct. So synthetic charts are actually very helpful. Synthetic lungs, eh. But synthetic charts are very helpful. Okay, if you don't have any more questions, I'm going to move because I'm going to come into the magic. Uh, this is a magical position. It's called a box, okay? So the box connects with the synthetic lungs and the synthetic charts, and of course with a uh, uh, put cool parity. Okay, I have a great question. What is the risk of synthetic long or synthetic short? Well, in theory, uh, if you are doing this with uh, European options, there is no risk other than the same directional risk. No, synthetic long will suffer if the stock prices comes down. The synthetic short will suffer if the prices goes up. If you are doing this with American options, there are many risks. Okay. I mean, remember that American options could be exercised at any time, it could be assigned at any time. So the risk of holding synthetics with American options is that you could get, a, it could be broken, you could get a sign on any of your legs, okay? Uh, uh, and, and, but the, the position is directional. I mean, a synthetic long is a bet that the stock will go up and a synthetic short is a bet that the stock will go down. So it's the same risk that buying or selling or going short the stock. Now, the box, on the other hand, is a magical thing. So let's prepare your minds for this. Uh, imagine, for a second, that we decide to have a synthetic lung at, a, at an strike, K1. We just enter a synthetic lung. And at the same time, we enter an, a synthetic chart. I don't know where I put exotic chart, okay? I apologize for the type, which will be synthetic chart. At a different strike, let's call the strike K2. What do we get? Okay, so I'm going to ask the question before. I don't look at the math yet. Uh, in theory, <laughs> if I am going long 
And if I'm going short at the same time, I should have nothing. Okay? I should have nothing at all. So, um, but if we do this with options, we get something. And this is what I am uh, doing the equation here. That's what is so interesting because uh, going long and short simultaneously is like doing nothing. You know, you're buying and selling the things right away. But with options, open the door to something very interesting. So in a synthetic long, the equation, what we have I, is this, you know, we, and we saw it now, we saw that is S minus DF times K1. And the synthetic short is minus S plus DF. Uh, K2. So the position is the I add this two. So if I add this two, the S goes away. And ta my position doesn't depend on anything. Like it doesn't really depend. What I have really doesn't depend on the options. It doesn't depend on the stock. And the only thing I have is a constant value. That is the difference of the strikes. Now that's the is and the, the value is more or less constant. Okay. So everyone will say. Uh, okay, I enter at the position of a certain price and I close at the same price. And oh, boo what, what happened here? And so the box on the outside looks really boring. It looks like nothing happened. It looks like I just waste my time and pay a lot of commissions, but no. As the question from Steve uh, or from David before was, a discount factor changes. The discount factor is a function of time. So in this case, uh, the, the trade is not about the stock, the trade is not about the options, the trade is about the discount, discount factor. Because we know that at expiration, if we hold the box all the way to expiration, the discount factor will be 1. But as time passes, the discount factor, uh, you can make money on changes of the discount factor. That's what a box is, you're making money on the changes of the discount factor. And I, I'm looking here, for instance, this is a typical discount factor equation for index options, for S&P 500. And okay, X is the exponential function, T is the time to expiration, so if it's uh, in, in years or whatever, no, minutes, in whatever unit you want to use, so it decreases. Now it will be zero at expiration, that's why the whole thing becomes one. Uh, Q are dividends and R are interest rates. Q are not quite dividends, it's the dividend yield, okay, that's, that's more exactly the dividend yield. And R are interest rates. So notice that right here the discount factor changes with time, but more importantly it changes with this cost of carry right here. And, and is a bait, uh, box is actually a play on the cost of carry. In fact, the box is the best way to borrow or to lend money with options. And that's how they are used. Boxes are used by tremendously big players to borrow billions of dollars uh, with options. They don't need a bank. They just, <laughs> they just come here and, <laughs> and do a trade with a box. And uh, the, box, the box trade is basically a loan. So one of the guys is lending money to the other guy. That is basically what is happening. And at the end, when the trade is all said and done, the, the, when the one guy lost money on the trade. But the loss is the equivalent of the interest that you will have paid on a loan. You see my point? So boxes are really good as, as non-official of the book loans. And it's heavily used. And you will see them all the time with S&P 500 options. Another thing interesting about boxes are, are that uh, boxes are also a good way to play interest rates in the future. Imagine that right now interest rates are zero, okay? But what happens is we are very near zero, okay? They are really, really, really low. And what happens if I know for a fact that the Fed will announce a rate increase in the next meeting? I know that I have in inside information or my, you know, all of my things are pointing that that interest rates will go up. So the discount factor will change. And I could enter into a box trade just to play the interest rate changes. So boxes are a way to play interest rate changes. So uh, they are very interesting uh, things. And what is the structure of a box? It's just basically a synthetic long plus a synthetic short. If you have folks any questions, just let me know. I'll, because I continue you talking about boxes. <laughs> so, okay.
boxes also have other uses, very interesting uses. And those are, this is like really advanced for option traders is, if you remember, put call parity is a law for European options, but just a suggestion for American options. So, you, so if you don't really have to have put call parity, it doesn't have to hold for American options, okay? Yeah, and that's one of the reasons that you can have box plays, you can find box plays in American options in very, in very interesting conditions. The most interesting conditions is when the stock is hard to borrow. In a hard to borrow situation, uh, the synthetic short, this synthetic short, the discount factor of the chart uh, becomes really big. Uh, so the synthetic chart becomes really expensive in this case. And uh, versus the synthetic long. So there, the, there is a, the box becomes unbalanced. The box doesn't really respect put call parity anymore because this, the, the box is hard to order. So doing a, a synthetic long, it really makes no difference because you can play, you can buy the stock and synthetic long is nothing. No one cares about the synthetic long, but because the stock is impossible to locate, the synthetic chart becomes really attractive and everyone is doing a stupid synthetic chart and therefore it becomes really expensive. Okay? <laughs> so the box becomes an arbitrage. You might, you can, you could make money on the box because they have to borrow stats. And right here, I'm going to say that this is where most option traders, when they are starting to research about options and they find the bugs and they start experimenting with it and they go to like a crazy thing, I don't know, Nikola or whatever, or Tesla when Tesla was heavily shorted. Um, they, just, they start finding all of these tremendous opportunities of free money. And like, man, this is free. And they go into the box. And I, and I don't know if they, I don't even know if they realize they are playing a box, but they, they come into this trade structure and uh, they discover that it has, it's an arbitrage, but the reality is that it's not. The problem, remember, with American options is that they can be exercised at any point. And what happens most of the time, what happens most of the time is that the box will be broken. And the box will be broken because, uh, the short legs will be exercised. Remember what a synthetic long is, you know, the synthetic long, in the case of the synthetic short, it, you have a short leg, a call as a short leg. And in the case of the synthetic long, you are short the put. So you are short puts and calls uh, uh, in, your, in your box, uh, a certain strike, a different strikes. And depending on conditions, they, they will get a sign on your shorts and the whole box explodes and you will be on the hook for a lot of money. So don't do box, even though they are really tempting to do them as a hard to borrow. Uh, just be careful. I mean, there are ways to do it. I play, I play this, but I play this in a completely different way. I play this in a way that the box can never be undone. No, so, so that's, that's, the, that's the way I do it. And also I don't play until expiration. I just enter a, an expensive box, box and sell an even more expensive box. So, so the idea is enter when hard to borrow is starting and sell when hard to borrow is even harder to borrow. That's the best box trade, okay? No, never do the box trade or oh, it's hard to borrow now, let's wait until it becomes normal again. So those are boxes. Any question about boxes? and longs and synthetic shorts. The interesting thing is that all of this comes from the same equation. All of these things come from put call parity. Every single one of the, these things. It, they are a consequence. If put call parity didn't exist, you could not do any synthetic longs or synthetic shorts or boxes. Okay, so no questions. Now let's move into the meat. Put call parity and vertical spreads. Vertical spreads are very common uh, trade structures. And in fact, in the Gamma Optimizer room, we do vertical spreads all the time. But most people don't realize that vertical spreads obey put call parity. And it makes sense because in vertical spread, you are selling a call of one strike and you are selling a call of another, or buying a call of another strike and you are doing with puts. I mean, you are buying and selling on the same expiration as slightly different strikes. And then we, I pose this question to you guys. Uh, if I do a vertical call spread, let's call it um, BC, and I 
also do a vertical put spread with the same strikes. I mean, the call spread and the put spread are going to use the same strikes, uh, the same two strikes. Okay. Um, the question is, are they the same? Are they different? How they be they behave? Uh, is, is a vertical call spread different than a vertical put spread? Because the question is meaningful because in the in the real world world calls and puts are different. You know, the, a call is a different thing than a put. A call makes money if the stock goes up, and a put makes money if the stocks go down. But a vertical call spread and a vertical put spread, the question is, are they different or not? So I'm going to give you the answer right now. They are not different at all. They are exactly the same. See, okay? And I'm going to show you why they are exactly the same. They are exactly the same because of put call parity. So imagine that we are going to do a trade. Okay, with the same strikes, and we're going to use a vertical call spread, and we're going to we're going to do the experiment with a vertical call spread, and, a ver and the experiment with a vertical put spread, and we enter the trade today, and we get this price. We get a price called VC1. I don't know what is pr that price, and then, and then I got a, another price for the put spread BP1. Okay, and then later on we close them, so I get another price for the call spread, and I got another price for the put spread, and I have a profit. They have a the call spread gave me this profit and the put spread gave me the profit. And the question is, what is the relationship between the profit of P1 and P2? Can we find a relationship between those two profits? Okay. And if you know that put call parity exists, it will be a really hard problem to solve. You will have to model these and do all sorts of simulations and wow, so it becomes a, a very interesting mathematical problem. But you know, we know put call parity equations. So it's very simple to work. Let's start with the pull call parity at, at entry and the pull call parity at exit. Okay. So let's start uh, like the pull call, call parity for a one strike is this one. You know, this is the call at one particular strike and the pull at one particular strike. The call at this strike, and those are the equation. Is the this is the normal pull call parity equation? The stock is the same for them. Okay, it's the same stock, and then. Because doing an, a, an, an spread is buying one and selling the other, then we are going to do that. Let's, let's do that. So you notice that if we do that operation, we have this. We have the price of the spread. We have the difference on the calls plus a discount factor. The difference in the strikes should be equal to the difference on the puts. Okay? And notice that the stock disappears. There is no stock price anymore in this equation. And right there, it tells you that the vertical call spreads and the vertical put spreads are the same thing and they are connected and they, it, it doesn't matter what the stock price is uh, the only thing that matters are the strikes and the options used but I, notice that this is a call spread and notice that this is a put spread you can tell right away and that's what I am rewriting this whole thing like this the vertical call spread plus the discount factor of the two strikes is equal to this thing so the vertical spreads are connected, the, val the, the value is connected. So, and, and it, is not, it doesn't depend on the stock, okay? And it's right here is the proof that it's the same thing. But if you want more proof, when we close the positions, then we have the same thing. No, we have a discount factor. And then we, 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 we compute the profits, we subtract subtract from this equation, the, this other equation that we have here, okay, and then we get that the profit of the put spread has to be equal to the profit of, of the, the, the profit one equals profit two, the profit of the call spread is equal to the profit of the put spread. So we can conclude that vertical spreads can be implemented with puts or calls and it makes no difference, okay because we get the same profit on the trade. It's different than when we use calls or puts. Now, calls or puts are different, but vertical spreads are not different. And the, this is the reason why, because of put call parity, okay? I put an ast star there, an asterisk, because I know that I might have a few students here that, wait a second, there is something there. You, you made a mistake, you made an error, because the discount factor when I open the trade is different to the discount factor when I close the trade. So therefore, this term doesn't cancel completely, you know? And I tell you, you are right, you know? You are correct. The, 
the discount factor is different and yes there is a slight advantage to one spread over the other who what spread will have the advantage well that depends on the discount factor you notice here that it seems that if the discount factor is positive is bigger than one okay if the discount factor is bigger than one it seems that the put spread might have the advantage no and vice versa if the discount factor is uh, less than one then the call spread might have the the advantage and of course all depends on the difference is this a positive number of a negative number so the the uh, a spread that has the advantage changes depending on the discount factor and also depending on the strikes if the strikes are the difference of the strikes are positive or negative more generally uh, the, the spread that has the advantage is the credit one so you will find that when you do this if you enter at a credit you will you have a slight very slight advantage over the debit but the thing, the whole advantage is, only, is an illusion. Notice that the whole advantage is a play on the discount factor. Okay, therefore, the whole advantage is a cost of carry thing. As you see, it's a cost of carry, and the thing is, in the United States, when you do these things in a regulation T account, you are not carrying. That's the problem. Like if, if you get if you sell a put spread or you sell a call spread in a regulation T, you are not earning interest on the credit receive okay so that's the key difference so that's why this is this is what the theoretical advantage lies in the interest rate on the credit but in reality you cannot so so there is no advantage of getting the credit now because if you hold that for a whole year your broker will not recognize interest on that you see and therefore the slight advantage on the discount factor disappears and the point remains valid is that the vertical spreads are the same okay so uh, this is all that i have for this particular i think this is more than enough time i have more for put call parity but i'll close here at uh, uh, vertical uh, spreads i hope that you enjoy it and i hope this provided an interesting theoretical framework to understand why synthetic longs and synthetic shorts work and why the box uh, is an interesting trade too and um, and also why in vertical call spreads and put spreads are exactly the same thing and you you see me repeating this on the gamma optimizer room all the time but uh, this is the reason why uh, these things work because there is call put call parity in the next session we will go over some practical examples of how to make money with the box for instance and um, how to structure all more complex trades that relied on put call parity so for now i appreciate you folks joining thank you very much uh, for joining and i hope that you enjoyed the the presentation oh i have a question okay so you hold the box until expiration or you have to daily check the position until when when you do a box trade uh, and, and we cover this in the next class uh, you don't hold it until expiration you basically hold that thing hold your breath <laughs> praying that no one will assign it and then you you close it when you have a nice uh, profit on it that's that's what you you have to do you cannot with american options hold the box until expiration they will not allow you to okay so thank you folks i hope you enjoyed your weekend and i i really really appreciate that you join uh, the live session even though this was supposed it was meant to be just a recording for the class i i I'd rather enjoy having you guys uh, uh, live and having questions and, and I, I, this, everyone benefits from this kind of format. Thank you again and enjoy your weekend. Take care.